Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to One on One with Jerry Hall. Today's guest is none other than Raul Powell from Real Vision Finance. Now, this conversation is going to take a few lefts and rights. We're going to talk about his mentors growing up, especially in his professional career. We're going to talk about Real Vision, their goal, what they're trying to accomplish. We're going to dive into topics such as why major players in the digital asset space aren't talking about Ripple or XRP. We're also going to discuss life in the Caymans as well as life in Costa Rica. So I hope you folks enjoyed this conversation as much as I had doing it. So Raul, so gracious of you to take your time to join me. How are you today? I'm great, thank you. Thank you for inviting me as well. We're here on this Caribbean special, right? You're in Costa Rica and I'm in the Cayman Islands. Oh, absolutely. This, this show should be in nothing but shorts and flip-flops. That should have been the mandatory dress code for this show. Exactly right. <laughs> All right, before we begin, I have to congratulate you on global macro investors being 15 years now. Yeah, that was, you know, I opted out of the rat race uh, after running a hedge fund and decided, well, maybe I'd learned a bit on, on my journey through, through the financial industry. So I started writing uh, macroeconomic investment research and it caught on. And still to this day, you know, it's, it's a very honoring thing to be paid for your thought process. So, you know, and that's been, you know, many of the world's most famous managers, the offices, sovereign wealth funds, governments, all pay for, for global macro investors. So it's very, extremely flattering. I would be flattered also. Good job. Thank you know, it's interesting that, um, that the dynamic in which one develops skills that are sought after by others, so much so that they're willing to pay for it. I've experienced that in construction people found my skills to be worthy of payment. And so I spent a lot of my years building things for people and they paid me generously for it. And I'll be forever grateful for it, that. And, and one of the things I, I take apart is how did I get there? How did I get to a place where others sought me out to give me money to perform a service for them, right? And I, I think it breaks down to, um, principles and qualities that I've adopted. And one of the questions that I have for you today, a little exercise, is name three leaders, alive or dead, that demonstrated a quality that you've adopted into your own life. And I'll, and I'll give you an example for me while you think about yours. One would be for me, maybe like President Obama. And the, and the principle or quality is articulate communication. That's a really hard question. And I've, I've never thought about what leaders I've followed and how what they do to myself. My career was based a lot around learning from famous hedge fund managers, how they did things. And I would see, and I was very blessed to people like Paul Tudor Jones, Stan Drucker Miller, Lewis Bacon, and a whole bunch of these other famous people within our industry and have learned from them. So I think if, if we're in the context of finance, I learned how to use a chart from Paul Tudor Jones. He taught me that you can see everything with a chart first. From Lewis Bacon, who's the, the legend who, who runs More Capital, um, it was about how to construct trades, how to think about what you're trying to express in your idea that you're trying to invest in. And thirdly, is Stan Druckermiller taught me how to put the whole narrative together. Um, I think George Soros, I didn't know, I haven't met George Soros, but um, in his book, Soros and Soros, and another number of other things that he wrote, a lot of it was how he'd map out the probabilities of everything all going on at the same time, 
and thinking about those moving probabilities and how does that affect asset prices. So I've done a lot of that. Um, in terms of running a business, I think there's a guy who is at Andreessen Horowitz now, which is um, one of the biggest VC firms, and um, Ben Horowitz's book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things, is like a Bible of running a startup and how difficult it is and the kind of times you have to go through. Um, so that's taught me a lot about the temperament that you need, how to deal with optimism plus fear all at the same time, um, and how to think about risk as well. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I have, uh, when I said leader, I didn't necessarily mean somebody who was an authoritarian or put into a position of power. No, um, sure. You know, I, I have a, I came up in construction um, under a man named Mel Daniels, and, and I'll never forget this quality he pounded into me. And that was, if you say you're going to do something, you do it regardless of how you feel about it. So don't say things or don't make agreements that you're not going to follow through with. Like meeting a client on time, like finishing a job on time. Like if you say you're going to be on budget, well then finish on budget. If you're not sure, tell them you're not sure. And that served me very well because I notice a lot of people in the world have a tendency to tell other people what they think they want to hear. And I found you to be somebody like that, just watching your videos. Like I can distinctly remember an element in, hang on a second. Are we going into a recession during recession week? And you presented your thesis and you said, hey, I could be wrong, but I want to talk to other people and get, and that little bit of humility that I have a thesis, it's pretty sound. I got sound information supporting this. However, it could be wrong. That little bit, of humility followed by the mountains of evidence you presented for the next 45 minutes in the video. I just, I really like that combination and that's something I think I wanna to try to take from you, if you don't mind. Thank you, I mean, I learned that from making mistakes. <laughs> so you learn for a while that even though your idea may be great, let's say it's an 80% chance of being right, the 20% still happens. Right. So you have to realize that just because you see the odds one way doesn't mean they'll play out in your favor. Because even though it's 50-50 to cost, toss a coin, it could come up tails. There is no ability be certain about anything and I think that really helps so here's a here's another one for you how's this I think you you partially answered this with my first question but um did you ever have any like formal mentor relationships anybody as you were coming up that said okay Raul there's some I see something in you here come with me let me show you let me and packed upon you my X amount of years of whatever? Um, probably not internally at the places I was working uh, within the banks and hedge fund. I would say my clients would do that. So these famous hedge fund managers, they would realize I was young, I was in my 20s, but they could see that I had some abilities to think in the same way that they did. So they were very good. There was a gentleman called Stanley Shotcorn. He used to be the vice chairman of Salomon Brothers. And then he was, the, he was uh, one of the partners of More Capital where he ran the equity side. And he was incredibly good to me. Taught me a lot, gave me a lot of responsibility. As a salesman, selling to him, I would wake him up in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning, you know, and you wake up a billionaire in the middle of the night. Um, so it better be right, better be important. And you know, he, would, he would give me a lot of faith. So. He really encouraged me in my abilities, and many of the many of those other people did as well. Um, the other thing that was really incredibly powerful for me was working for Goldman Sachs. Mm -hmm. Even though I wasn't really, I didn't fit in at Goldman so well because I found it a bit um, overwhelm overburdening in terms of 
how it was built as a partnership and its culture, but its culture was exceptional. How it taught you professionalism and excellence and learning to operate with people who are a lot smarter than you are. So you become humble in, in who you are and what your abilities are because there's always somebody a lot smarter than you. So, and that, but just the level of professionalism of that firm taught me a lot in how to operate. Interesting. I like that. You know, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the platform that you, that I found you through Real Vision is so diverse and, and it appears that as time has gone by, you have brought in more and more what seem to be constantly returning contributors who, who are like experts in, a, in an area under themselves. So you've got experts interviewing experts. This, this concept, I'm just curious if you could walk me through the creation, right? The vision and the creation for Real Vision, because it is just to me a remarkable platform to bring information to people. After the recession in 2008, I was living in Spain, and Spain was bad, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, really, really bad. They had 50% youth unemployment, that kind of stuff. The banks almost going bust. And I was writing about it and predicted a lot of it, and I found out that people would come to me and say, why didn't we know? Friends of my parents or friends of friends. And that sat really uncomfortably with me. Why should some people know and other people shouldn't? And it's all about access to information. So it was at that point I knew I wanted to do something about that. The Occupy Wall Street movement was kind of dead on about this. You know, there's, there was two different societies here. There's the financial elites and everybody else. And I thought we could do something about this. So then cut through a few years, I met Grant Williams, one of the co-founders, and he had done a few videos. And I'd never met him before, and we had dinner in Spain. And I looked at the videos and over dinner, we said, well, why don't we start a video company? Um, and maybe we can get the most famous hedge fund managers in the world to speak on it because I know them. So that was the idea. So we went to speak to a few people and said, would you appear on this? And they said, sure. I mean, if you're going to give us an hour of our time as opposed to three minutes, of course. And then so naturally, because I had been in the industry, I said, Grant, it became a peer-to-peer -peer interview. And that's what we hit on, was peer-to-peer. -peer. So then what you're doing is you're not a presenter with some notes in front of your face saying, okay, what's next? What you're doing is just having a natural conversation with somebody where you've got two inquisitive minds and two people with a knowledge base creating something that one plus one equals five. And that's really the magic of real. Excellent. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. Um, unfortunately, I'm still... I'm that guy with the notepad with the notes, but uh, someday I do hope to be able to provide, um, you know, a content to a, to a, a population base that, that is bringing the kind of value to them like Real, Real Vision is bringing to me. Um, one of the things I found extremely compelling were your recession week, series that you did, um, and most particularly, the famous Doom Loop. And I was curious if any of those, if like if the Doom Loop's been updated and if there's anything that you can share with us. So for people that caught that eight or nine, 10 months ago, where we are with that same setup today. Well, listen, now we've got global growth slowing quickly because of the coronavirus on top of the trade tariffs, on top of the tightening of monetary policy, right? So we've got a very high probability we're going into recession or we're in recession right now and, and a global recession. So in a recession, the biggest buyer of shares in the world, in the US market, is corporations buying their own shares. There in fact, is no other buyer of shares, bizarrely. They're the only buyer of shares, really. So in a recession, corporate cash flow falls, obviously, because you sell us stuff. So their ability to take on more debt, or their appetite to take on more debt diminishes. So therefore, 
they stop buying shares and issuing debt. On the other side of the equation, because who's the buyer of those corporate bonds that they keep issuing? It's the pension system for the retirees. Now, that is being driven by inflows coming from tax receipts because these pension funds have these big holes in them. So they've increased taxes to try and put money back into the pension system. And these guys are holding, is, are buying these corporate bonds and equities. The only other buyer of equities. Now, the problem is, is tax receipts are also linked to the business cycle because people earn less in a recession, so there's less tax receipts. So you end up with a situation where you could see the buyer of equities disappear and the buyer of debt disappear at the same time in a recession, just as a natural consequence of what goes on. Then you've got a problem. And the problem being that there are three trillion or so of government, of corporate bonds that are the triple B rating. So they're still investment grade, but if they get downgraded, they're gonna start moving into junk status. In which case, pension funds can't hold them, they have to sell them. Now, considering pension funds are already not able to buy bonds because there's not enough tax receipts, there's no buyer. So what you create is a vicious loop of equities falling and credit falling. And again, I don't claim there to be a certainty, but I think there is a much larger risk of this happening than we care to admit. Um, how does that get circumvented in the end? Well, the Federal Reserve probably has to buy corporate bonds or support, or support the pension system. Probably for, probably for the current state of, of um, politics, they would have to support the pension system. So you support the pension system. Well, for the voters, state. right? Sorry? For the voters. Pension, pension systems equal voters. Exactly. Okay. So in the end, they won't rescue the corporates, they'll rescue the voters. Now... So, but somebody has to underwrite this probably at some point because this doom loop can lead to total destruction of a lot of things. And the problem is, is all of the, who are the holders of all of this? They're basically 60 to 75 year old people. Right. And if you, and most of them are starting to come out of the workforce. So if you halve somebody's in retirement savings at age 65, you've got no way of making it back. So the behavioral aspect is you end up selling anything you can, crystallize your losses, at least I know what I've got. Having seen my father go through this, uh, seeing many other people go through this, that's how people should act and will act. They won't say, well, I'll just wait and see for the next five years. Well, because suddenly you're 70 years old or 75 years old and you're going to run out of money in case the money doesn't come back. So it's a very complicated world. So that's what I fear. Now we are in a slowdown phase. So we're now at risk of the doom loop rising. Things like the strengthening dollar don't help and it's been screaming higher recently. So we just need to wait and see and be cautious to see. We will see it in the share price of GE, Ford, General Motors, General Electric and Dell. Those are, and AT&T. Those are the big triple B companies. If that starts, first we'll see it at the biggest extreme in the credit market, we've already seen it in triple C's, which are the worst credits of all, they've already started widening. But this wall of money coming in from tax receipts has kept all the yields lower than they should be. But if that switch flips, then they're gonna quickly scream higher and it's gonna knock all the way through. Wow. Is there one particular source of information that somebody like I could go to, to kind of, to see that canary in the coal mine kind of thing, because it would make sense to me that not all these corporations are rolling their debt at the same time. They don't all have exactly the same cost to carry for, you know, these new, because they're just in this debt thing. How did you term it? You coined the term, this debt orgy. <laughs> and, and so at some point, at some point, if your values are going down, I'm just, I'm asking a question. If these company stock prices go down, so it means their valuations go down, it's generally going to be associated because their earnings are also going down, cash flows are going down. If that, how are they going to, how are they going to re -roll, how are they going to roll this debt? If, because obviously they can't pay the debt down because the cash flows are down, earnings are down. They're going exactly. to do something with it. Is there, is there some canary in the coal mine that I could kind of keep, 
on my desktop. You know, we have been, we're blessed in the last six years, I would say, six to eight years with this magical thing that levels all information in seconds. It's called Twitter. Ah, follow Twitter. Okay. Because in that is everybody. Um, it's <coughs> unbelievably powerful. I mean, I don't look at other news sources because they're all embedded. The links are there from people I trust. I curate who's on my list. I look what they send me. I you know, weigh it up whether it's interesting to me or not, or I agree with it or disregard it. Whatever. It's all there on Twitter. It's like we've democratized all of this. This financial Twitter community is extraordinary. And we've democratized information there at a ridiculous level. You know, the same is true in the digital asset space for cryptocurrencies. Yes. I mean, it's instantaneous. Like, um, I was going to ask you about this because there's been, you guys have put quite a few hours of content out about specifically Bitcoin and, and some other cryptocurrencies. And you have, you've had incredibly successful people dive into this space, like all in. Dan Moorhead, Barry Silbert, Mike Novogratz. These, these guys were very, very successful before crypto ever was even conceived. And now they're all in. The thing I find very interesting, because I'm in this space for two years now and study like a mad dog, I don't ever hear anybody ex talking about the company Ripple or the digital asset XR XRP, which seems to me to have the fastest route to success, profitability, global adoption, all these metrics. And yet all those guys I mentioned are all investors in the company Ripple, but they never talk about Ripple and they'll never talk about XRP. And I just wondered, like, have you heard about Ripple and are you aware of the XRP token? Yes. Um, I am no expert on Ripple. Look, it is impossible for anybody to be up to date in everything that's going on in this space. I've never seen so much activity in one space in my entire life. You know, even if you try to figure out what's going on in Ethereum, what's going on in Ripple, what's going on in Bitcoin, what's going on with the Lightning Network, what's going on in the other tokens, the independent tokenization and the digital assets, the central bank digital currencies, the Libra, I mean, there is no chance anybody can stay on top of it. Um, Ripple to me, I don't know enough about it. Um, I've focused a little bit recently on Ethereum for similar reasons to looking at Ripple. I think one of the reasons why Ripple is not so talked about is because it's more of a banking solution and there's a lot of investment banks, others who are working on the Ripple, so it's less of a publicly visible blockchain. True, true. And so, so therefore it's just visibility, so people don't really know, you know? So a lot of people don't know about, you know, many of these tech, but you know, people don't really know what Oracle does. Because awesome. it's all in the background. Good point. But you kind of know what Microsoft does. So it's just, it's that, I think. I think it's just that, um, you know, and I know there's a lot of debate about Ripple and the supply of Ripple and what that means for the, for the token. And again, I don't, I don't really know. Because what I've thought is, if the tail of information with all of these different ecosystems, which are all valid, is so big, how can we know? So you either focus on the one thing you do know, or you focus on the benchmark. So you could be a bond investor, and you could be, you like this part of the curve, or you like this or that, or you like this credit or whatever, or you could just say, listen, I just buy 10 year treasuries, because I'm just, because that is still gonna move regardless. So it's kind of, that's why I think a lot of people have gravitated towards Bitcoin itself, because it gives you one thing. Even then, it's difficult to understand all the things going on with that. So, so it's only for that reason, I think. I think it's just, it's an entirely new world being built, Jerry. And how the hell are people supposed to get up to speed with a world that doesn't exist yet? That is a great point. I am, I'm two years in the space, you know, literally retired. All I do is study, 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 study. It seems like, you know, I might have two hours of Netflix at night that's about the extent the rest is I'm reading, I'm studying, I'm following real vision, I'm following this, I'm following that. 
And although, and it's been primarily around the digital asset XRP and Ripple, the company and the use case of transferring value from here to there globally, I still don't know it all. And I'm, and it, I do deep dives. I mean, I'm, I am as knowledgeable as anybody I know in the space and I still don't know it all. So yeah, right. it, it's, it, you're right, it's impossible. So that makes sense. Like, so like somebody walks into my office two days ago, was introduced by one of our investors. And he's like, okay, this is what I'm working on. Non-blockchain, but he was looking at decentralized computing power by using mobile phones and internet of things. And he's already got it up and running. So science faculties at universities can get massive computing power by basically renting it off this whole network of computers. And I'm like, and there's like ways of paying for it. They started with a token system. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, I haven't even thought about this or know about this. I mean, and you can, you know, three days ago, you know, and three weeks ago, the Brave Browser guys were here talking about Brave and what they're doing and the tokens that they've got. And you're like, okay, so I need to understand this. I need to understand that. You know, it, it is impossible. It is impossible. I think it's incredible where we're going. The, uh, the, the, the entire, this whole new space for like monetizing, monetizing things, monetizing content. Uh, uh, for instance, I'm involved with a, uh, not involved with the company. I have a subscription to a company called Coil. And if your website was embedded with the Coil enabled, Coil enabled, whenever I watch Real Vision, I would be streaming micro payments to you. Many YouTubers are already doing this. And for instance, you uh, Real Vision could could enable your deal to accept Coil payments. It's super. It's right there in the browsers. It does. You don't have to be a subscriber to receive the money. Hmm get paid by subscribers. But that whole model of paying one subscription fee and then being able to pay different content creators all over the world for whatever content I'm consuming and nothing for what I'm not consuming. That's an interesting case for, you know, financial management in my mind. Well, don't forget, you know, even um, Tim Berners-Lee is building out another version of the internet where you own your data oh, yeah. and that you can lease out your data. So everyone's in charge of their own. And that's some of what Brave is doing as well, is you get then control over that situation. So the micropayments is how that works, where, okay, advertisers come to you, say, I want to use your data. You say, fine, you're going to have to pay me. So what, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're basically knocking out the third party, which is the platform. So right. Google and Facebook are making a lot of money and you're saying, well, it's my data, you pay me. And so then you also say, and you can't have my data. So that whole, that whole thing is coming, right? Data and how data is dealt with and who owns their data is gonna be also distributed. I mean, I'm excited about where things are going. Are you even despite knowing that we're in a possible doom loop recession? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm super excited about all of this. Financial apocalypse. Like, <laughs> you know, I don't know if we get a financial apocalypse, but I do know that in the meantime, piece by piece, the smartest people in the world are building a parallel system. Right. And that, you know, that was one of the, so one of the, one of the questions I had written down, I said, I kind of asked Raul about this. And I think we may have just answered this question, but if you can expound on it, it'd be great. The next growth engines, because obviously it doesn't look like China is going to be a big growth engine for us coming up soon here with within other nations with their current monetary policies and, and just the way the economies are, I don't see a nation being the next, next growth engine to drive economies up. I think it's going to be something like a tech or it's going to be something, an individual thing, internet of things, AI, robotics. I don't know. Do you, do you have a, a spin on that? There's many things. But, you know, if you're talking about the future of money, it's future new financial system, the recorded ownership of assets, the Dan Tapiero, the security truth machine that is all the blockchain and the big, that's good enough. <laughs> now, this is, I mean, that's a very big thing. It's monster. <laughs> right on. Yeah, there's, so one, there's, there's like one quadrillion of derivatives out there alone. So, so there's plenty to be made from this being 
something really big. Now, does it employ that many people? Well, guess what? There's a lot of people um, starting businesses in the space because when you're starting brand from scratch, an entire thing, there's plenty of opportunities to do all sorts of stuff. So who knows? Well, if you're somebody that follows human capital, this space is attracting the best and the, best and the brightest technical okay. minds. Um, last couple of years have seen the best and the brightest of financial minds entering this space. Totally and when agree. you get those two together, you get the guy with the money and the engineer who can build it, you put them together, bada bing, bada boom, all kinds of incre you know, incredible things can transpire. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. I've never seen anything like it in my entire career. We saw a bit of it in the internet in 99, 2000, but nothing like the level of brain power and experience that's going into this. It's like the hive is building, I say, I keep saying, the hive is building an entire parallel financial universe from scratch while we're still running the old one. It's unbelievable. Wow. So it's like the world is coal powered and we're gonna to move to oil and nuclear. Now, oil still glass, so it's not, it doesn't mean the financial system has to go, but it just slowly gets replaced. And we'll see that with payment systems and how browsers work and micropayments and remittances and you know, bit by bit, it'll just get chipped away and chipped away and chipped away, much like electric vehicles will do the same to um, you know, gasoline powered vehicles. So you know, the combustion engine is going to tail off over time. Okay, that's good. But a lot of people in financial markets want to treat it like a shock, like one day there's nuclear war and the next minute the cockroaches come out and there's a new financial system. It, you know, and meanwhile, you've been living off gold. It doesn't work that way. Um, but what is clear is where it's going. Man, I'd love to hear you say that. I'm, I'm a big fan. I'm a big supporter of this movement. I, I see it benefiting my children, my children's children. The, um, it, it's, so, it's also, it's really kind of cool because there's so much of what Real Vision is doing that dovetails in and out of these things. I mean, you know, one broadcast will be, we'll be taking a look at cash freight shipping, this very old way of measuring how things get moved from one place to another. And, and, and then the next show with a different host and a different expert, we're, we're, we're talking about how cars, autonomous cars are gonna pay tolls in their own Wi-Fi bills and be interacting with other autonomous cars. I mean, it, it, it is just like, wow, crazy. And that is the point is, look, there is a lot of negativity around where we are in the business cycle, the debt burdens, the secular issues, <coughs> but there's also a ton of opportunities in the future. You know, there's an opportunity set that comes out of it. You know, yet again, at some point, we've been worried about China for a long time. Okay, China's now in a really terrible situation. Yeah. But at some point, the dollar will stop strengthening and will reverse. I think that will be a part move towards digitization of currencies, not in a, not in a you know, one stop, we're all changing, but I think there's a tipping point to come soon. And then we're gonna have 10, 15, 20 years of emerging markets rallying. So we'll be talking about, you know, how's your India investment portfolio going? Did you get into Brazil early enough? Well, you know, there's always an opportunity. So financial markets are very interesting for that because it is a, it's a 3D jigsaw puzzle that you can never solve, but you get prizes as you go for solving parts of it. Um, and so that's, that's why it's so rewarding. That is an, I love that analogy. Good job. I may cut that out and that may be just like a little, a little teaser for this, for this interview. Well said, you know, you. Um, that, well, that leads me to, to um, another question. What's up in store for Real Vision? Because one of the things that I've been noticing over this last year is that you've had a couple of incredible promotions where you'll do a three-month trial for a dollar right in the midst of when you are like doing a full court press on a very poignant topic. The recession watch was one, and that's when I came into the picture. And now... And I can't remember if you did one for the retirement crisis or not, or that might have been. So we guess the, the, we've done three. One was recession watch. One was Bitcoin versus gold, and the other one is the retirement crisis that's running at the moment. 
right now. The reason we do that is, sure, we're a business, we're going to acquire new customers, but actually it also is, these are three very important things. So we wanted as many people to know. So if they drop out in the end and view our free chat content on YouTube, great, knock your socks off. But at least you're getting the content. So just trying to get people to spread the word and say, listen, look, it's not easy. You come to Real Vision at first, you're like, wow, there's a lot of information here. But settle in and like everything, you begin to understand the language and you understand what's going on. And the, what you get is an unbelievable value from having access to people you just never get access to. Right. Exactly. You know, I, I, you know, I used to watch network news and, and like cable television and you would see people, like there were people I remember seeing Mark Yusko as a great example. <clears throat> I'd see him do two or three minutes on CNBC. And I could gleam in that two or three minutes that here's somebody that knows what he's talking about. He isn't going to sell me something that he doesn't believe in himself. So the story, his narrative, he believes in, right? I totally got that. But you only get him for three or four or five minutes. I tune into, I tune into Real Vision and I'm watching Mark Yusko do an hour masterclass on value investing. That's right. And that's the true difference, right? Oh my, you can't, you're not getting that anywhere else. There's nowhere else that's happening. Nowhere. No, no, it, it isn't. It doesn't exist. It doesn't. And I don't think I'm alone in that. This digital asset space, right? This, 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 um, the catnip that was the end of 2017 with $20,000 Bitcoin, how many people that brought into this space me being one of them when I got in in February 2018, getting me into the space has done one thing and it's opened a door to, an, to a rabbit hole of learning that is far beyond blockchain code. It, it, it's this whole financial literacy path, this whole understanding of how the world is working. And your channel has been a, a big help for me and, and I hope that this interview will reach some people that might, you know, maybe the five or six yeah, people. We, we've planet. redefined what we do now, and we've come up with a new tagline for the business. So our mission is to democratize the very best financial intelligence. But what does that really mean? Is Real Vision is there to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy um, with real in-depth analysis by real experts. And that's what Real Vision does, right? It gives you, you walk into that world, and you start to understand how the broader world that we live in, finance, business, global economy, how that all works. Yeah. But it's not being told by a presenter. It's being told by participants in it, real experts. So, and this stuff is that depth. We don't treat it flippantly. We don't do light stuff. So you get everything you need in one thing. And that's the real power of real. I can't imagine this won't be at some point. Maybe when the history books are written, it'll there'll be a you know footnotes in, you know, when you have to go look up a term or you look up something, it'll say go to Real Vision, episode blank so and so. Grant Williams speaks to so and so about gold. You'll find blank. Someday. One day we'll get there. One day. All right. I'll tell you what. I have I've exhausted my questions. And we're getting close to the end, but I always give, like, if there was anything, do, do you have any questions for me? Yes. I'm going to ask a relevant question because what you have done is something that I talked about in the retirement crisis, and I partly did when I moved to Spain. So you could have retired or semi-retired in, in the United States, but you didn't. You went to Costa Rica. What did that mean for your retirement? What benefits was it by moving to a system where healthcare is much cheaper, the cost of living is much cheaper, quality of life is high? You know, obviously your ability to earn income there goes down, but your ability to have lifestyle goes up. So as somebody who's kind of semi-retired, what did it what did that look like? Because that's I think a, that's a real good people, question. People need to understand this because I'm a big proponent of this. I've been talking about multi-generational households, that's okay for some people. Other people, I said, look, relocate. It's not that risky. It's not that terrifying. 
You're living in a country that speaks Spanish. I presume you didn't speak Spanish when you turned up. Oh, mi español es muy malo, señor. Exactly. And so, to, to talk me through that a little bit. Well, okay. So, I, I was, I had surrendered to the fact that when I went to Hawaii, that I would probably work out my days exchanging labor for learning and food at these organic farms. I just was having a blast. But then my mom got sick. I went to New Mexico. And it was, it was in that, I was in right outside of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and for four months while my mom, you know, she passed. And looking at the way her finances were just in a shambles, and I started thinking, seeing this mortality. See, I'd never really ever put much thought, am I going to die or not, you know, any of those kind of things. And seeing that she, at the end of her life, the quality of her life, was not what I want the quality of my life to be at the end of my days. And it made me think I need to do something. I had a little bit of money, not a lot. Got on the phone with a friend who'd been very successful and he walked me into, you know, investing strategies and starting to invest. And I started to make some investments. I made a little money. I came down to Costa Rica with the full intention that I would live on $350 a month and allow the little bit of money that I had to build up and become something that I could have wealth to pass on to my children. So that was the thinking. To come down here, um, for instance, I live in a, you know, a 20 by 30 studio apartment. My electricity is paid, garbage, water, cable, internet, total for $350, uh, sorry, for $200 a month. And then I had food and stuff for 150 a month. It's amazing. So that right. liberates you, right? That liberates you. It, it humbles you and it liberates you because I'm coming, you know, I've come to a country where I, I wasn't fluent. Well, I didn't know the language, wasn't really clear about the culture. And because of things I've learned from other people in my life, I came here being hope, open and humble and saying, okay, this is your country. It's your language. I'm a guest here. I'm going to learn to fit into your space. And it is amazing when you see these people, you know, the, these gracious, gracious people, how they live. Most of them live very modestly. There might be one car for a family that's living in two different houses next to each other, seven or eight people, but one car. Maybe one of them has a bank account. They all work in some way, shape or form, but it's not like, you do when you're in the states it's it's very humble one of the happiest countries one of the happiest countries in the world i absolutely adore it like this is what i want to make my home and when i vacation i want to go to the caymans you know what i mean drop by say hi to Raoul, but you know i'm not necessarily interested in living in a place where it cost a ton to live. And it, it's, it was a real mind shift to go from a monthly nut of about $5,000 a month in expenditures, you know, mortgage, interest, car notes, motorcycle upkeep, my jet ski upkeep, blah, blah, you know, all this stuff, right? To go from that to, to literally 400 pounds of total belongings. That's all my clothes, my laptop. I mean, that's everything. It has been freeing. You're absolutely right. But the goal is that I don't, I, I'm okay with sacrificing now because I've got something working that I expect will reward me handsomely for the sacrifice. Exactly right. And I think that it's a good lesson for all. I mean, I did, the, I did it from London to Spain and cost of living. I mean, trading in a, a three bedroom apartment in London and getting a incredible house on the side of a mountain in a beach town in Spain that was like oh my god really and the weather sun shines 250 days a year and it's beautiful and the food's fresh and I grow all my fruit and vegetables and that was a huge shock how good that was I mean, the Cayman Islands great quality of life ridiculously expensive um, living on an island because everything's imported gasoline's imported da, 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 da. I mean and they charge because it's a tax-free island they charge duty on everything that comes in because they don't uh -huh. have to charge income tax or anything else so food is crazy expensive. So to be a worker here or a retiree or something, it's really difficult. Now you folks in the Caymans are still basically not under British rule, but you're no, under the British, 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 
we're a um, British overseas territory, so we're, we're as a British protectorate. So we have a governor on Ireland that's British, but we have an independent parliament, an independent government, et cetera. We have oversight from the UK. Well, who do your taxes go to in the end? Do they go we to the... Have, we don't have taxes. On anything? No property tax? You have a stamp tax when you buy a house. You have right. work permit fees. Um, and you pay import duties, which are the supermarket, whoever pays the import duty, you don't pay them if you import stuff. So if I go and buy a you know, a new set of glasses from the US and bring them in, I don't have to pay tax on it. We do um, that in Costa Rica also. Yeah, and then other than that, there are no taxes. So there's no property no, tax, no inheritance tax, no income tax, no corporation tax, no capital gains tax, no uh, nothing. Now, do you, do you see yourself and please, this is not an insult or being, do you see yourself growing old there? I'm starting to see that. I didn't at first. I live between two islands. Um, you know, really it's down to, you know, do you have enough money to grow old here? Really? That's uh -huh. the honest answer. Um, because of how phenomenally expensive it is. But yes, I would, as long as I can spend a bit of time in Europe as well, because I love Europe. I love traveling, but, you know, I'd love to spend a bit more time in Spain or, South France or Italy, um, you know, I've spent, I've had a house in Spain for 20 years. So, you know, I, I'd love to do a bit more of that just to balance it up. So you get a broader, deeper culture. I spend a lot of time in New York right now. So that, that kind of helps. My mum still lives in Spain. So I do that. But yes, I mean, I actually, I, I like it here. I like it here. It's a nice community, good people. Um, it's small enough that you can know everybody right. uh, and big enough that you could disappear. And with technology, you're not disconnected from the world, obviously. We're an hour's flight from Miami, three hours flight from New York, and there's direct flights. There's direct flights to London, direct flights to Houston, Dallas, Denver, Toronto. Yeah, we're super connected here, so it works well. So I wanted, and this, we can close on this, but I find it's really kind of an interesting introspective into who my guest is. I'm fairly, your father passed not too long ago, right? A couple of years back. Yeah. Yeah. Can, uh, uh, yeah, you're not here. You mind if I ask you a question about that? No. Yeah. Did he get a chance to tell you how proud he was of you before he passed? Yeah, endlessly. Endlessly. He was very, you know, he was immensely proud of me and he always told me so. Um, so that was always, that was yeah, super nice. That is so great. And you also get to share that with your mom, right? I'm sure your mom is immensely proud of you. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, I you know, speak to my mom all the time and she comes over to the Cayman Islands, we go to Spain. So we're all still very close. That is so cool. I'm, I feel very honored to have got to spend some time with you. I hope that I've ingratiated myself to you and, and you'd be open to hearing from me again in the future at some point. Jerry, I really enjoyed it. It's been, been like a nice little therapy session as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want, I want to wish you nothing but the best personally and for all of your folks at Real Vision. Thank you so much. Hey, guys, keep doing a good job because it is affecting and helping others. I can attest to that personally. That's amazing to hear. And I'm really, really grateful for you to say so. Right on. So folks, thank you so much for tuning in to One on One with Jerry Hall. My incredible guest, Raul Powell, can be found on Real Vision Finance. Got a YouTube channel, got a private subscription network. It's got also an incredible research outfit called Global Macro Investor. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna put links to all of the ways you can find Raul right in the show notes right below us. And until next time, everybody, Pura Vida.